with God in you. Feel the love in the sanctuary. Lift your voice and repeat after me. We come together. We come together. We come together. We come together in the name of love. We come together. We come together. We come together. We come together in the name of love. The person next to you. Say, God loves me and I love you too. Feel the love in the sanctuary. Lift your voice and repeat after me. We come together. We come together. We come together. We come together in the name of love. We come together. We come together. We come together in the name of love. From every block of life, every creed and color, in kinship we. We come together. We come together. We come together in the name of love. We come together. We come together. We come together in the name of love. In the name of love. In the name of
down in my soul, I recognize that there is indeed a power in the universe that is greater than we are. One infinite power that is continually and forever expressing itself through and as each and every one of us. So as we come together this day for the purpose of expressing and experiencing and celebrating this magnificent thing that we call life, we do so with joy in our hearts, for we know that we are blessed. We know that this service is blessed, and we know that that infinite presence is always with us. So we just give thanks, we let it go, we let it be, and so it is. And so it is. We are an interfaith gathering, a spiritual community that honors all teachings and all spiritual teachers. We begin our ceremony today that celebrates the oneness of life, acknowledges that all people and all faiths come from the one universal presence which we call spirit or God. Our candle lighter, th lighter this morning is Claire. <laughs> Let us begin. The Tao, honoring the universal path of harmony and equilibrium, the natural way. Shamanic traditions, honoring the beliefs and practices of all indigenous peoples, the way of pristine spirituality. Hinduism, honoring the path of knowledge, action, and devotion. Judaism, honoring the ethical path of living by sacred law. Buddhism, honoring the Four Noble Truths and the path of compassion. We're saving money on candles. We're not <laughs> throwing away your tithings. We're frugal around here. Christianity, honoring the Christ consciousness as the path of love. Islam, honoring the path of submission to the will of God as the highest calling. New Thought, honoring the metaphysical path of mental healing through the practice of universal spiritual principles. And our last candle is the healing candle of love. We invite you in the stillness of your own mind to bring to awareness the names of anyone you wish to be included in this healing flame of love and light. And now that all of our flames of faith are fully lighted, we move forward into our celebration, realizing and reaffirming that all paths lead to God. Our inspirational quote this morning is a two-parter. First is from Reverend Dr. Ken Gordon, who is the former uh, spiritual leader of Centers for Spiritual Living Worldwide. As metaphysicians, we believe the essence of a thing does not exist in its form, but the thought that precedes it. Accepting the expansive nature of life, it seems obvious that what we think today must become enhanced and expanded in form tomorrow. Second half is from Walter Hagen, and he says, don't worry, don't hurry, and be sure to smell the flowers along the way. And now music. I see joy, I see peace, I see goodness surrounding me, I see love in every breath I breathe, I see God in everything, I see happiness, I see freedom, I see the beauty that lives in me, I see perfection in what life brings, I see God. I feel the beauty that lives in me. 
I feel perfection in what life brings. I feel God in everything. I know joy, I know peace. I know goodness surrounding me. I know love in every breath I breathe. I know God in everything. I know happiness, I know freedom. I know the beauty that lives in me. I know perfection in what life brings. I know God in everything. I know God's in everything. I know God's in everything. Thank you. Well, that choir sounds awesome today. <laughs> you guys are really uh, on fire, so thank you very, very much. Aaron, thanks for pulling this all together. She is great. Well, welcome, welcome to the Alaska Center for Spiritual Living. Uh, thank you for all of you who uh, have come out today and are here in person. And we also want to thank you who are watching uh, live online, Facebook Live, as well as those who are watching later on Facebook and uh, the ones on YouTube. Uh, it is indeed an honor, so thank you. Um, by way of announcements today, I. I think it's important for us to start. One of the basic spiritual practices that we have in this center, in this movement, is that of affirmative prayer. And I get to watch that every week. I get to see demonstrations of positive effects from affirmative prayer every single week. Uh, and people know I'm always saying TSRW, which is short for this stuff really works. And if you have a condition in your life that is challenging you, is giving you that little rise where you feel anything less than perfect, I urge you to submit a prayer request. And you can do so in, in many different ways. Uh, perhaps the most common one we have is online. You can go to our uh, webpage, cslalaska.org. That's easy to remember, cslalaska.org. And right on there, there's a big banner that says prayer request. And you can pop in there and fill it out. And it is uh, sent out to all 17 practitioners. Um, and we will pray with and for you for an entire week. Um, another way you can do it is what's called a one-minute miracle. If you are present here, you can tap one of our practitioners on the shoulder. And they will be happy to give you a one minute miracle right here and now. And I'm trying to think of the practitioners that are here. I see Linda, Karen, uh, uh, Cynthia. Uh, Cynthia, Judy, uh, Michelle. It's kind of on the borderline. Uh, <laughs> Ann Robert. She can't deny that she's a practitioner. I mean, she. I know whether we have a license or not is a different thing, but she's a practitioner. Uh, Camille, Robert in the back, uh, Bob, Bob. Judy. look Anne. at, oh, Ann is here, and of course, Reverend Savannah, um, I think I've got everybody, so you can see we've got Camille. numerous practitioners, oh. yeah, I think I got the missus, boy, I'd better leave her out, <laughs> and this is a simple process, you just state the nature of the condition that you wish to have changed, and the practitioner without a whole bunch of stories and preaching or anything else, goes straight to the spiritual truth and will know that truth for you. It's really quite an experience. And if you are not comfortable with that, if you're a little nervous about it, and you, I don't know, you can fill out a prayer request form in the back and put it in the box. Um, the forms are in the uh, uh, foyer, and uh, we will get those out right after service today, and the practitioners will hold that truth for you all week. Uh, a lot of things going on uh, in our center over the next few months. Perhaps the biggest, the biggest one for us are classes. And um, some of you may be new to us. Speaking of the people that may be new to us, if there is anyone who is here today for the first time, um, if you are bold enough to raise your hand, Judy will have a welcome packet for you and it has information about what we believe and uh, kind of who we are. We're not 
some cult. We're, we're pretty mainstream. We're, we're kind of tame, actually. So feel free to raise your hand, and, you, and we'll get you a, a packet. And if you're not ready to raise your hand, we can deal with that, too. You can just pick one up at the back on your way out. Uh, okay, new people. Um, and you may have questions about classes. We've been talking about classes all summer, the classes we're going to have in the fall. They're going to be starting in September. Um, but if you don't know, I don't really know what this class thing is all about. We're going to give you a sample. You get a chance to actually attend what is kind of like a class. Uh, Ann and I are going to put it on on Tuesday, uh, August 30th. And it is going to be... It, we, I put two hours down on there. It might not last that long, but we're going to talk a little bit about our center, who we are, why we're here, why we're doing all this, and then a few answer a few commonly asked questions about science of mind and about our center. You know, what do we believe about Jesus? What do we believe about heaven and hell? And some of the kinds of questions that people may have, and we're going to address those. Uh, so uh, I invite you to come. It is on Tuesday the 30th from 6.30. Oh, I only made it an hour. 6.30 to 7.30. There is no charge for it. Uh, it's just kind of a fun time, and you can experience it. Now, if you are out in hinterlands, you're you know in Bush, Alaska, and can't fly into town for this, you can uh, tune in, uh, and we will send you a Zoom link. Um, but if you'll have to send an email to us so we can send you the Zoom link. Um, you can send that request to office, like office, at cslalaska.org. Um, and we will send you that link. So I invite you to give it a try, and then you can find out if it's too scary. <laughs> uh, okay, next is foundations. The next thing we have is our foundations class. It's going to be taught by Lynn Steiner, <laughs> practitioner, <laughs> and Judy Wolf. Um, starts on September 15th. Um, they said eight weeks. I don't know how they're going to squeeze that in, but I have, yeah, they're amazing. They can squeeze 10 into eight. I'd cry fine with me. Um, <laughs> Now there's a fee for this, and it is $295. Um, you may not have $295 uh, of disposable income at this exact moment, but you would like to take it. Uh, so we have people who have taken classes, have experienced the benefit from taking these classes, and wish to pass it on, and have agreed to provide scholarships for people who may not attend because of the cost. <coughs> that doesn't mean that this class becomes free. It means that there is someone out there who has a generous heart, who has experienced something wonderful, and they want to share it with you. So if you want to come, email to office at cslalaska.org, and we will hook you up, we will marry the two of you so that you will be able to attend. Um, this class, Foundations, is a prerequisite for all of the rest of the classes that we have in CSL. Well, I won't say all of them, but almost all, most of the rest of the classes in CSL. Uh, and we will have uh, at least one Zoom chair available. So, um, but it's designed primarily to be in person. Next class is self-mastery. Gain a mastery of the art of living as conscious, intentional beings. Uh, it'll be Tuesdays. We start September 20th, November 8th, uh, about two hours, 6.30 to 8.30. It'll be taught by <coughs> Kaleem and Bob. It is online. Um, this investment is $245. And once again, we do have uh, some scholarships available. The prerequisite is to have taken foundations, and it is by Zoom only. Another thing that we have is today, after our service, my good friend, Reverend Savannah, is going to conduct a breakthrough workshop on boundaries, the boundary workshop today. It's after service at 1230. Uh, the cost is $45. It is in person here in the sanctuary 
uh, and we will, we'd like to know how many people are going to be here so we have an idea of how to prepare for it. But um, the, the flyer that we put out had some things in it that resonated with me. Do you say yes when you really mean no? <laughs> oh, yeah. Do you struggle to communicate your needs to others? Oh, I'm fine. We got it all handled. Yeah, I'm a minister. I can do anything. I probably walk on water. <laughs> do you have a paralyzing fear of being rejected? Who, me? No. If you have any of these, this workshop will be a great benefit to you, and I <coughs> urge you to uh, attend. I want to talk a little bit about Reverend Savannah. I asked her for a bio so I could give you guys, and, and this is what she gave me. She said, Reverend Savannah Noel is a speaker, a teacher, relationship coach, she started her spiritual path at the age of 16, Mile High Church in Denver. She supports people in their discovery of healthy, connected, conscious, intimate relationships and worthiness. She's an ordained minister with a master's degree in consciousness studies, and she's been a guest speaker at events in London, Vancouver, and Cairo. We graduated together. We were in uh, ministerial school together, and I think she was the youngest person in our class, and I was the oldest. <laughs> and, it, you know, spirit does have an awesome sense of humor. Um, we ended up being matched up as prayer partners, and Savannah and I stayed prayer partners for years after ministerial school. And so I kind of got to uh, grow up with her, and she kind of got to age with me. So <laughs> it was a, a, a great experience. Uh, I first met Savannah, uh, I think she had just turned 17. We were on the National uh, Vision Corps together. And I, I was just brand new and everybody addressed each other by their first names and they were all ministers except for me. I assumed for probably the first six months that Savannah was already a minister. Um, my point in this is it's a very high level of consciousness. There's a unique ability to see beyond the effects, to see beyond whatever is going on in that world to, to know a higher truth. And, uh, and that's what we're gonna experience today in this workshop. Um, some things that she didn't talk about, uh, Savannah was the main master of ceremonies at last year's convention. Uh, what a treat it was to show up the first night of the convention and who comes popping out as the main MC, but my old buddy Savannah. Uh, she is going to be the um, keynote speaker at the Big Sky Retreat uh, in Montana this coming uh, summer. That is a retreat for all New Thought uh, ministers where uh, many ministers can get together and uh, share their, it's for everybody. It's for everybody and can share their uh, miseries. Um, she sits on the CSL events uh, committee, so she is intimately involved with all of the conventions and all of the things that we do. So uh, we see uh, Savannah on a national stage. So when we uh, finish our uh, music, inspirational music, Savannah will be our guest speaker. And so with that, let us turn us over to special music.
choir. Let us take a holy breath. Take an inhale. And an exhale. Let's do that one more time. An inhale. And an exhale. It's so good to be back. I see some familiar faces and I see some new faces. Um, I was just... Uh, reflecting while Reverend Don was speaking. Thank you for that intro. That was a really wonderful introduction. And uh, I was just reflecting on the fact that it's been seven years since I've been here. Can you believe that? Like, time is flying. And uh, I remember I had just started a 23-city speaking tour. And your center was the first one on the tour. And it was a 10-month tour, it was a way in which I wanted to get experience speaking more so, and I wanted to know what was going on in the organization. There's Michelle, it's good to see you back there. And, um, and I just remember uh, I had just come back from uh, a really long journey living in Cairo during the Arab Spring, and the Science Mind magazine had come out, and my face was on the cover, and I thought, you know, I need to launch a tour to maximize on this opportunity. And so your community was part of that, the tapestry of that. And I remember it. I remember the workshop after. And I just want you to know that it was meaningful for me. It's awesome to be back here. And it's extra awesome because I live in Seattle now, <laughs> <laughs> which means that I'm not that far away. I can actually come back. Uh, yeah, I'm based in Seattle now. I just, um, uh, I just ended a two-year uh, ministerial posting with Amazing Grace Spiritual Center, and now uh, I'm doing this and other things. We'll get into more of that later. But uh, I just wanted to say thank you to Reverend Don and Anne for having me. Um, it's been so fun. And also, um, I'm going to be talking about something that I think is very relevant right now within our communities. It's also relevant within the organization. It's something that I find we have a hard time talking about. And if you remember, seven years ago, my whole talk was all about how to find the sacred in the midst of the shadow, how to find the sacred in the midst of darkness, how to look at the, uh, the shadow as the disowned parts of ourselves, the parts of us we don't like, and actually bringing them into the light. And so today's topic is called uh, the new thought shame trap. There's no question that the science of mind uh, teaching, this new thought philosophy has changed the lives and saved probably thousands of people. We consider this teaching a liberation theology, a theology that gives the power back to the individual spirit that tells us that we are not born in sin or separation, but that we are inherently divine beings and that we have the ability to co-create with, uh, with life, with each other, and that we can create the life that we desire. It is a theology of oneness, of unity, uh, and it tells us that love is the greatest power there is. That the God of our understanding, or whatever name you might want to use for God, is within us, and that we have dominion over our thoughts and our attention. It tells us that we are loved. 
that we are valuable and that we are connected to a source that is creative. And you know, there is great empowerment in that. As a child coming into this teaching, and as an adult who many of you might have washed up on the shores of this philosophy of, uh, Anch you know, here in Anchorage, many would say that it felt like home. Anyone? Yeah. A majority of you, it felt like home the first time they were introduced to it, and it was the thing that was missing in their lives. It was the thing that pulled them out of utter despair and separation. It was the thing that allowed them to see that they mattered. But it wasn't going to be without some personal ownership and accountability and responsibility. It wasn't going to happen without a little bravery. But I have also found that it is a slippery slope. Because I, I don't know if this is popular opinion, but I believe that it could be considered a theology of privilege. Ernest Holmes the founder of the Science of Mind Teaching, his audience was primarily open-minded, white, middle-class, progressive Christian folks in New England. And so, on some point, at some point on the journey of my studying, you know, I was engulfed in this teaching and it made me feel so good. You know, I started at 16 years old going to the teen camps. You know, I had this feeling like many of our young ones when they go to this camp, it was like, I feel so loved and I'm connected to people of like mind. I'm accepted by my peers by telling me that, you know, you are amazing, you are whole, you are complete, and you have a spark of divinity that lives within you, that I was not broken. It offered me uh, this really beautiful perspective on life. You know, I had opportunities to travel the world and to teach this philosophy to thousands of people with my classes and with workshops and facilitations and trainings to give people a sense that they are not alone, that there is something powerful within us that wants to create, to become more and never less than our true, authentic self. And the part that isn't always talked about is the human part of life, the humanness. Questions like, how do we work with our pain? How do we work with our grief? How do we reconcile the suffering and the poverty in the world? How do I come to terms with my feelings of not enoughness and stagnation? I would travel to countries in the world where I would see that as a person of different class and privilege, you know, I, I could just leave it. I could go in, see the conditions, and then leave. I could go elsewhere. I could turn my eye away from the atrocities because of the life that I have been given. And this, for me, personally, as a, as a minister of this teaching, has been such a conundrum, a new thought conundrum to me. Because if we bring it down to a micro level individually in our own life, how do we address collective shame? That's why the works of Brene Brown, and Glennon Doyle, Cheryl Strayed, Elizabeth Gilbert, they're all you know, feminists, however, their work has been so inspiring and impactful in my body of uh, work in how I teach because they do not spiritually bypass hard things. You know, this month's theme, I don't know if you're following the themes, but it's all about nature. And for a lot of people who would consider themselves as you know, non-religious, uh, nature seems to be the place where they connect. I truly feel that if we are ever in question about anything in terms of our existentialism or God or life, we can just go to nature. I mean, look around us here, right? Because nature is constantly in flux and it is constantly changing. It is this great metaphor of life. When I first became a new minister, I think this was back in 2014, I believe, and uh, I remember sitting down with a colleague of ours, the incredible Dr. Roger Teal. And he was uh, the minister at Mile High Church for many years. He's been in ministry for 30-something years. And that's one of our largest, if not the largest, New Thought community in our whole organization. And I asked him, I said, Dr. Roger, do you ever feel like an imposter? Do you ever feel like you're not really that adequate to teach all this? And he said, Savannah, of course. 
He said it's part of the growing and it's part of the becoming. You're always going to be questioning. I think the tragedy of our teaching is that often we are not given the permission, the compassion, or the space to be human, to question, to go off the path, to fall, to feel negative emotions. This is the shame trap that I'm talking about, and I'm sure many of you can relate, you can resonate. Just as evangelists are often uh, shunned for asking too many questions, I find that it is a similar feeling with a new thought that if we are not good metaphysicians, if we're not doing our work, if we are questioning everything that we've ever been taught or believed about God and life, there is shame. We cannot uphold this religious science status quo. We might even front that we have our lives together and that everything is kosher, everything's good that we have a great spiritual practice, that we're totally prayed up, when deep down there is another story that's going on. That is the story I want to know about. The greatest gifts, I think one of the greatest gifts of this teaching is found within struggle. It is found within our pain and grief, within those moments where we are on our knees. And it takes just one person one person to believe in us. It is found, I think, when we are in the fire of life, doing what Araya Mountain Dreamer talks about in her book, uh, The Invitation, where it's, she says it's doing what it takes to feed the children and not shrinking back. It's standing in the fire. For me personally, over the last, I would say, year, but I think for all of us, for the last three years, um, I've been experiencing this. The entire world has changed with the pandemic. The entire Sunday morning new thought experience has changed for many of us. You know, how we um, do church in the morning. And I don't know if we've caught up to what that actually means as an organization yet. I don't know if we have yet asked, uh, you know, accessed that grief that we're all carrying. But I know that for me, when I uh, ended my time at Amazing Grace, I was laid off there, I had a moment of total uh, darkness and despair. Of all the years that I've been in this teaching, I started questioning everything. You know, I um, had gotten to a point in my business, my own personal business and ministry, where I'd come so far, and then I felt like everything was crumbling down around me. Everything that I had worked for and become was falling apart and I couldn't, I felt like I could not reach out for support because of that shame. You're a minister. You should know how to get yourself out of this. Did you call your practitioner? <coughs> and just the fear and the shame of that thought kept me from doing it. It kept me in resistance even greater shame to the point that I felt utterly alone in this and then I started questioning my purpose. Have you ever been there? Mm -hmm. Where I thought, oh, I worked so long, so many years, for 20 years in this movement and now what? What is my purpose? What am I doing? Is God really all there is? Is it really all good? Yes, I could have called a friend, and yes, I could have called a colleague and someone that I knew could love me best. But my pride was too great. Have you ever felt that experience where you let your pride get in the way? I've been in this teaching, as I said, for a really long time, and this is the first time, and I was telling Reverend Don the other day, I thought, you know, that's pretty great, actually. It's the first time I've ever really, really questioned everything because I was so young when I came into it. It was so natural, it felt so part of me. It just felt like, yeah, well, of course this is the truth. Of course this is the way life is. The Buddhists would say, this is beautiful. <laughs> this is the path. Let go of everything that you think you know and let go of your attachments. You know, during COVID, I too, like all of you, we were in this interesting place of having to run a morning service and I had a production team that I um, had put in place there and 
at the same time, I was trying to figure out, well, how do I hold the grief of, of a community and also my own and show up authentically and in integrity and provide hope? At the same time, I was striving for greatness to fulfill my purpose, to fulfill my dream. You know, faith is easy when everything's going great. <laughs> when everything is uh, going well and it's aligning perfectly. But, you know, sometimes... And what I'm realizing is that we have to brave the wilderness. And that can be a lonely path. That can be a lonely journey. Back in the old days, and when I say old days, because I know age is, you know, irrelevant, it's not really a number, but back in the old days of probably, I want to say, uh, the early 80s, uh, old school. <laughs> I know. I know. John, it's got it. I'm, I'm giving you a, a time, time reference here. The old school religious scientists, they used to have this yearly convention, and we have them now. And I used to hear stories about people in this organization, ministers and people who would fight each other at these conventions, where this teaching of oneness and unity and love, and we're fighting. And then back in the, I don't even know, 40s, 50s, our organization split into two. Separation. They would throw around things like, well, what is it in your consciousness that created that? Which is so embedded with shame. What was it in your consciousness that created that thinking? This guilt for not having right thinking. We fear, I think, sometimes as religious scientists, as ministers, as lay folks, as people, as practitioners, as good religious scientists, that I must always uphold principle no matter the condition, yes? I must release my shame and my fear and my guilt, my doubt. I must do all of the things. I must meditate and pray. I must show up to all of the groups, the AA meeting. And sometimes the striving for that engenders the exact thing that we talk about turning away from, which is more shame. So how is it then that I come back to the thing that I know and have always believed about myself, that I am whole and perfect and complete, that everything is truly working together for good when I am suffering? What do I do when it feels like it's just too much? I was listening to a podcast recently, and an author on this podcast uh, that I respect so much, she said, I've been loved too well to ruin my life. I've been loved too well to ruin my life. I have this dream over here that I have yet, you know, have yet to fulfill. And I feel that it's a setback. It, and it isn't going to ruin my life. And I'm going to aspire for greatness. And then my job is to evolve. And I don't get to decide how I'm going to get there. I don't get to decide what happens when that detour comes and that other job that I took to fund the dream, which is what happened in my life. <laughs> the other path that we didn't plan, right? Sometimes we need one story to get to the next story. It's just a detour. Have you ever had that experience where you had your, your heart and your eyes set on something and set on a goal? And then you got distracted over here with other things from doing the thing that you wanted to do, like writing a book, like starting that podcast, like starting a business, like going after that relationship that you want. The fear of not being great can creep in. And then we get to ask ourselves questions like, well, what is it that matters more? The author, Cheryl Strayed, uh, I love her, she talked about this in her own story because she set out to write the great American novel. That was her goal. And she says that she kept self-sabotaging because she kept herself from it. She would do everything in her power to not sit down and actually write the book. <laughs> and what she said was this, what matters more, writing the great American novel or writing a novel that may or may not be good? Accept what is true now. My dream is to write a book, and the only book I can possibly write is the one I wrote, and it's none of my business if it's good or right. So let go of this idea of greatness, because what happens after is none of my business. The pursuit of the thing keeps us from the, the thing sometimes. 
Because what's driving us is the external. We want to be driven by something that is inside of us. So I want you to know that I don't say all these things up here uh, to invoke some sense of pity, but more so, I want to shine the light on this condition. We say to turn away from the condition, right? When we're doing a spiritual mind treatment, turn away from the condition. But sometimes what I'm finding is we cannot get from deep grief to joy in one leap of consciousness. We must first get to willingness. And from willingness, we might even get to hope. And so maybe the condition is the thing that catapults us into wanting to become more. Maybe we get to just make it okay that we feel what we feel because it is all temporary. It is all temporary. As I was saying earlier, years ago when I launched that 23 City Speaking Tour, you know, I had just been living in Egypt during the revolution. I remember the name of my workshop was The Sacred Amidst the Shadow. And as I was saying, it was about finding the sacred and finding that spark of life and divinity within the darkness because I was there during such a volatile time that I was really being challenged of how can I really teach this? Do I really believe this? Again, the same question, but years ago. I didn't really know, though, what it meant to know the sacred until now. The sacred is there while you're sitting in your discomfort when you want to bury it and you want to hide it, you want to run from it. The sacred is in our silent moments of introspection when we're facing a health challenge or when someone has left us, when a relationship is over. The sacred is still there sometimes as this gentle nudge or this whisper in the breeze. And what I'm coming to know now and what I want to impart in this message to you today is Every minister, every practitioner, every human being has shame. We all have painful and angry and hard thoughts. And I am not alone in this, and neither are you. But what it means is we get to really practice radical acceptance. Radical acceptance, accepting each moment, taking a step, and then taking another step one step at a time. It literally can be one step at a time. We can do the hard thing that has been placed upon us. And even if we can't believe in this moment that it's working for our good and that a higher power has got us, we just keep taking the next step. It's okay to be where you are. It's okay to question. It's okay to not know. It's okay to not know what's next. It's okay to feel everything that you're feeling, and it's okay to be wherever you are right now. Because what I'm learning is that the thing that we're meant to do, the thing that we're really meant to do, will become clear even and especially if it's not amazing. So we could, we could have the affirmation and the mantra of, come what may, life. <laughs> come what may. Maybe you've outgrown the life that you've been living in. Maybe you've outgrown the relationship or the job you're in. <coughs> Maybe it feels a little dark and uncertain and there's some fear. Maybe you're growing into something more amazing that you haven't even discovered yet. What I know about the last, I want to say, year of my life, as, as far into the depths of grief that I went, is that I couldn't see the silver lining. It's hard to see that when you're in it. I couldn't see the silver lining. It, it was important that I questioned everything. It was important to have an ego death. It was important for me to look at my own views of my own self-importance and the story and the narrative that I, I had created about myself. That ego death was essential because what it did is it deepened me in a way that I now can share with others. You know, for many of you, I'm sure, you've been through hard stuff. And that hard stuff, it, like, it, it refines us. It allows us to have compassion and empathy in ways we never knew. It allows me to be a better counselor, a better person, a better speaker. It allows that for all of us, which is why I say addressing the shame is so important. 
So if you find yourself falling into that shame trap, try to give yourself a little grace. A little grace. Some inner peace, because you know, the Dalai Lama probably has bad days too. <laughs> it's sometimes about also leaning into what Glennon Doyle calls, and we call it the same, the knowing. The knowing with a capital K. She explains this in her book this way. She says, if I'm unwilling to sit in the stillness with myself, I always know what to do. That the answers are never out there. They are as close as my breath and as steady as my heartbeat. All I have to do is stop flailing, sink below the surface, and feel for the nudge and the gold. Then I have to trust it, no matter how illogical or scary the next right thing seems, because the more consistently, bravely, and precisely I follow that inner knowing, the more precise and beautiful my outer life becomes. And so how is it that we know? When that moment of uncertainty arises, we practice the knowing. We breathe, we turn inward, and we sink in. We feel around for the knowing. You could do it in nature, you could do it when you journal, you could do it in meditation. You do the next thing that you feel nudged towards, and then you let it stand. You don't explain it, you just let it stand, and then you repeat it forever. That is her formula. I think I can do that. Can you do that? I think so. You know, a dear friend and colleague of mine uh, said to me recently, <laughs> he said, perhaps you need to divorce God, Savannah. <laughs> You're going through a huge divorce. You need to fire her, and you need to find a new one. And I said, you know, I like that idea. And so for me and for you, I, for myself, I'm officially making everything OK. And you can do that too. Let us go into a prayer now. Just turning within now and taking that holy breath. That breath that sustains us, it is the evidence of our beingness, of our humanness, of our aliveness. And so we sink into that oneness, that one power and presence that has got us right here. It is never an absence. It is the greatest power there ever was and ever will be. And that love, intelligence, that love is the very thing that we are, it is everywhere. It is the activity of life itself. It is breathing in, through, and as me now. And in, through, and as every single one of us. And so what I know and declare and affirm in this moment is that regardless of the condition, regardless of what is happening in the world right here and now, we allow everything to be okay. We hold ourselves a little tighter. We love ourselves the most. And when we can't do that for ourselves, we reach out, we ask for a friend's help, or we dive deeper in. And so I just give thanks for this community. I give thanks for this message knowing that it inspired many, knowing that the work that we are called to do in the world is of light, it is of joy, it is of love, and that we continue to explore it, to expand our consciousness out into the world. And so I want you in this moment to just think of anyone in your life that might need a little extra love this day, and we bring them into our awareness, into our minds. And we might even say their name softly out loud. In our grief, it is because we love so much. And so if you are grieving this day, if you are feeling any sense of pain or anger or separation, just offer the hand and the healing balm of love itself. For I know that deep below all of that, regardless of that, even though that is okay, love is present. And so giving thanks for this and the more, I am so grateful for this community, for the many ways that we contribute our love, our service, our attention to one another. And so with this, I say ashe, namaste, and so it is. Amen. Thank you, everybody.
once knew. If life's little stages are teaching me anything, it's everything changes and I can change too. Used to be when things got crazy, I get to feeling low, but I found out I can't let that face me, honey. Now I know when everything changes, I can change anything. Turning the pages, everything's new. If life's little stages are teaching me anything. Everything changes and I can change too. Who expects the unexpected? Life sneaking up on you. And sometimes we all feel disconnected. What you gonna do? When everything changes, I can change anything. Turning the pages, everything's new. If life's little stages are teaching me anything, it's everything changes and I can change too. Who's to say why it works this way? Well, it's kind of strange, but it's true. When everything changes, I can change anything. Turning the pages. Everything's new. If life's little changes are teaching me anything, it's everything changes and I can change too. 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 Thank you, choir, once again. You guys are awesome today. We've got uh, the full compliment today. <laughs> Plus, we have Chris from California. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is the time in the service where we are uh, given the opportunity to participate in another one of our spiritual practices, and that is the uh, spiritual practice of circulation. Uh, and we believe in giving and receiving, and so we have two ladies today, uh, and both of which I think are, take from one if you wish to make a donation, that's wonderful, if not, that's okay too, and the other basket is for an affirmation, and we urge everyone to take an affirmation. These things always work out really great because they almost always give me an affirmation for the thing that I really need on that day. What a wonderful uh. thing. Uh, let's see, a couple of housekeeping notes before we jump into all this. Uh, one is um, for the uh, workshop afterwards. Judy has a table set up in the back. If you would make your payment back there, uh, we would greatly appreciate that. It's $45. Um, so um, that table will be up in the back, and if you do that, we're good. Please uh, come up <laughs> and we do have some uh, scholarships um, available. Those have been uh, very generously given to us today. Some of our guests, uh, Luann Pogue, Ellen Call, uh, oh, Barbara Taylor, Michelle uh, Kuntz. I'm going to say Michelle Moore Jones, but she's here. Uh, <laughs> Sue Stone, Kaleem, Wendy Armento. I don't, my Armento, I don't believe I know her. Marion, I'm sure Lynn's with her. Uh, Karen. Mingus. 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 It's, the font is too little from here. <laughs> Boy, I can't complain, though. Mrs. Fleming's the one that's doing it. Uh, uh, Dave Lowell in Spokane. Dave LeMaster in Idaho. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Susie Peterson and Gwen Maudry, and I'm not sure where she's from. California, I think that says. Anyway, those are some of the people that are joining with us. Let's get this show on the road. We're going to get going. It's already noon. Uh, join us in our affirmation. Divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. Thank you, God, and so it is.
filled with gratitude. I am just so grateful for this time that we have had to share today. I am grateful for our powerful speaker and our powerful message. I am grateful for each and every one who has turned in live or recorded, here or absent. It makes no difference. Oh, and it wasn't California, it was Oklahoma. And I do give <laughs> thanks oh, for this time that we have together. I give thanks for my awareness of that infinite presence that is within each and every one of us. So we just give thanks, we let it go, we let it be. And so it, so is. it is, our so affirmation is. to the day is the one I pulled, I am a winner. I am a winner. And so it is. And so it is. All right, this next song is for everyone to sing. It's a call and response. Yes. So I'll point when we do it, and then you repeat, and I'll point to you guys. They can sing better standing, can't they? Oh, yes, they can sing better standing. Let's everyone stand. 